So who has exams that you have to contend with? Everyone? Right. So what are some of the... Let's think about preparing for exams, yes? So... Okay. So the ones where you can see past exams, then they're a good thing to look at. Because usually there's some sort of pattern in terms of how people will set exams, uh, particularly if they've got big classes like we have downstairs. We sort of tend to have a pattern we follow and change questions and mix and match and have some variation. But it's well worthwhile making sure that you look through past exams. But if you didn't have a past exam to look at, what might be some sensible approaches to preparing? You just read it. Yeah. Okay. Even have the past exam paper, I read the book. Yeah. So, and in terms of reading it, how active are you in reading? Do I just sit and read it, or do I actually do make some notes from it? What, what's going to make notes from it? Summarize from it? So that's one one thing that where you can make sure that you. So that gives you an idea of the flavour, but if you haven't got those, we'll come back to that in a moment. So we want to talk about what would be some of your main approaches if you haven't got past exams available. But some of the things to do with reading for an exam, or reading in preparation. If you your, your books standard textbooks, or they tend to be journal articles, or what sorts of things are you reading, or all of the above? Food variety. Textbook. Textbooks and we get like textbooks, slides, uh, articles, uh, case studies. Okay. When you first read something, what's something that's really useful to do with it? When you sit down to read. So the question is, do you just start? Let's suppose it's a chapter in a textbook. Do you just start reading? Or is there something better to do first? See the PowerPoint slides. We have the objective. Okay, yeah, so partly. Is that legible at the back? Yeah, yeah okay, good. First of all, let's. Let's take, um, let's take, for example, a chapter, but it'll be similar for a journal article or even a magazine article, if it's a marketing article or an ethics article, something like that. Um, read, so let's say reading a chapter or an article. Um, give yourself an overview of it. The best way to do that is to skim. skim. And make sure you make take notice of headings. Mm -hmm. Any diagrams or images? Captions on the diagrams and images. A lot of chapters have at the beginning. Hi. What a, what a, a lot of chapters have at the beginning. Some intro, so it's usually if they're well set out, they'll often have a point form intro, and they'll have a conclusion as well. Abstract. An often really good idea to read that, then jump right to the end and then read that, and then come back and skim that. Why? But why do we do this? Yeah, it's, well, your brain likes to have some sort of context for what you're actually reading and studying. So what's the overall, because if you just, a good way to compare it is, it by, is by contrast. If you've got a, a big complicated chapter and you just start reading it, what sort of things happen to you when you're doing that, you're apart from falling asleep? You're going to forget most of it. Sorry? You're going to forget most of it. You'll probably forget a lot of it. Um, and what are some of the challenges you find when you're actually reading through it? 
could be understanding what they're talking about. Yeah, it's because one of the ways we pick up new information and learn things is by association. So we want to associate things to as much as possible to what we know. Are you familiar with this thing? So what do I know? So as you go through this, or even if you're just skimming through a chapter, you're get starting to get some idea of, oh, okay, there's a heading there, and I, I know something about that. There still might be some question marks about what related to what you don't know. There's a couple of the things that you can do. First of all, you're wanting to get context for yourself. What's the thing overall about? What's the general message in the chapter? Have you been told all this before? No? Haven't. So let me know if it's, if it's old news and I'll make up something new. <laughs> so, yeah, because it, it's a bit like um, a, a, an analogy I often use is if, let's suppose I won Lotto and I said, I'm going to have a big celebration party. And it's uh, going to be, I'm going to find the park not far from where I live on top of a reservoir up at Kalara, and it's going to be on Saturday night, and you're all invited. So would you just start driving or just go out and get on a train if you had no idea where Kalara is? If you're in an adventurous mood, you might. But <laughs> you might miss the party. So what's a good way to get yourself, if, you go, if you've been invited to somewhere where you've never been before, what's a great way to get yourself there? Google. Sorry? Google. Google. Yeah, yeah, well, you have to look at a map and you get some idea. And if you're... Um, <laughs> you know, I've been... I was born before Google, so I know it's hard to imagine. <laughs> and there was a time where you just had to get a map and go, OK, well, I live here and Kalara's over there. So you have to get some overall picture of how to get from this place to that one and what would be some uh, potential routes, for what's going to be, the, I could drive this way or I could take the train or I could take a bus or if I drive, there's two or three possible routes to get there. What's going to be the best way? You're gauging things like time. Um, you're gauging things like... Uh, or distance, you're starting to think about well, what time do I have to leave? If I go to that party, what time am I going to get home? So similarly, when we're look, looking through this, we're starting to get an idea of things like, um, well, what do I know? What do I not know? But by giving yourself some context, you can be a bit more relaxed about what you don't know. Is it, is, has anyone ever got, scared themselves silly by what they don't know? When you start to read a chapter and you go, oh my God, <laughs> I, I don't know any of this. Well, that's the point. You wouldn't have to read it if you knew it all, would you? <laughs> You'd probably be writing it. So th this is a good thing. <laughs> but if you can, even if it's something that, even if you vaguely know, so there might be some things you know well, and there might be some things you vaguely know, but these tend to be like little bits of um, security. You know, if, I, if you're skimming through and you go, uh, give me a topic in marketing or something like that. That's all right. Yeah, SWOT analysis. You go, I thought a SWOT was something you did with flies. And then you go, oh, hang on, it's actually spelt differently. So you might, you get this little question going, okay, I've, I've heard of it, but I don't know what it does. But at least your, now your brain has something that's going, first of all, it's, it's got, it's on alert to find out what this is. But there's also this little bit of, well, at least I've heard about it. So that's a little tiny bit of security for your brain. But you're starting to fill in things like what do you know, what do you know well, what do you know vaguely, and what do you not know, because this is going to be the real point of the chapter. These things will give you a clue. But you try and just get this overall image. So this is skimming through and looking at your diagrams, looking at your captions, looking at the headings, getting an overall sense is like looking at the map to get from wherever you live to the party on top of the, you know, the, the hill at Kalara. And you're getting an overall view of where you're going to go. And at this point your brain goes, oh, that's good. That's way better than just starting a chapter and trying to, you know, wade your way through two paragraphs when you've got no idea where it's going. It really is it's quite, your brain actually needs some sort of direction 
to actually make the journey as easy as possible. So you have done that, haven't you? We've just started a chapter and have you found yourself asking questions like, where's this going? What's this chapter doing? Oh my God, this is hard. <laughs> so do the thing. You wouldn't, just, you wouldn't just head off if you had no idea where you were head. If I said to her, I want you to take a trip out to Dubbo and if you had no idea what was beyond the Blue Mountains, which would probably be the case for a lot of people in Sydney, you would want to look at a map and find out that's going to take you, you know, the best, most of a day to get there, even by train or even by fast car. Um, you can't drive that fast once you get out in the country roads anyway because of the edges. So you would want some sort of context and some sort of overall idea. Um, once you've done that, what's the next best thing to do? Yeah, well, we've all we've done so far is skim. And there's a couple of ways. I'm, I'm not following a particular formula in this. I'm just thinking, well, from what I've learned over the years, what would I, what would my next question be? The temptation is now to go back to the beginning and start reading in, in order. But that may or may not be the thing to do. So you've got some options now. But there's a really good question to answer. So what is my objective? For, what do you actually, what's my objective for this reading session? So now that I've skimmed the chapter or skimmed the article, what am I actually trying to do? What do I want to get out of the reading session? So if you're reading um, the journal article, what might be some different objectives that you might be um, wanting to get? Silence is very telling. Well, so what do, what do people do with journal articles? You mean the reader? Yeah, no, no, the writers. Oh, yeah, but good question, thank you. So first of all, what are the writers, what are some of the purposes I would write a journal article? They reflect information. They reflect information and usually some research or if, if it's a philosophical article, it might be an opinion, it might be if it's a magazine, particularly marketing magazine or an ethics, I imagine. There might be some philosophical and opinion pieces and you'd be looking for the strength of argument. So if, and you know, probably if I go back to a couple of years ago, well, it's probably three, two and a half years ago now, but up until I finished my PhD, there are thousands, millions <laughs> of articles. You can, particularly now that we've got everything online. So you have to actually get to a point where you go, why am I reading this? Am I reading it just to get a sense of what the, the people are doing in this particular field are doing? Or am I reading it now to actually pick up some research figures, so I will need the detail? Am I reading it to compare this person's argument with that person's argument and go, okay, which one of these is a stronger argument or do they both have good points? Or am I reading it just for entertainment? Um, am I reading it to actually learn stuff that I know I'm going to be asked about in an exam? And each one of the, the any one of those different things will have you read in a slightly different way. You'll be doing a different thing, approaching it differently. So it might be that with the chapter, you'd actually, having skimmed through it, you go, okay, well, this is kind of cool. I'm actually just, I'm interested in what I read the whole lot. Um, but it might be at other times you go, okay, well, um, there's, oh, there's a section on SWOT analysis. I know we're going to be asked a question about SWOT analysis. That's very likely in your exam, isn't it? So I, I might want to go, okay, well, let's have a look at this chapter's model on SWOT analysis and then actually make sh see if the way they des describe what, what S is for strengths, isn't it? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. threats. So is that the same as everybody else's? It probably is, but there might be some variations. I mean, in the coaching world and the GROW model, there's some, there's some slight variations in what they use for the GRO and W in that model, so th that can be variations. One of the things you might be looking for is, do they, does this, um, does this chapter give me a better idea 
of what exactly they mean by any one of those terms, opportunities or threats. You know how you, you know how sometimes people will give you a model like that and go, oh yes, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, that's really cool. Yeah, but so what? <laughs> if you had to do one of those, do you know what you would have to do with it? So it might be that you would be reading through the chapter to go, do they give me a good example of how to carry out a SWOT analysis for my own business or for another business? Are there good examples in here that give me a depth of understanding? So it all depends what you decide is your objective in reading. So if it's your first introduction to SWOT analysis, you might say, okay, I just want to see how do they define it, what do they call the terms, and do they give me some idea of how to do one? But if I'm preparing for the exam, I might have read two or three different versions of the SWOT analysis I'm going, which one gives me the best depth of understanding so that I can actually be the most prepared in the exam. Does that make sense? So this is, I mean this just sort of came out of somewhere, <laughs> but it's actually the, the, one of the most important things you can actually be deciding, because once again, it's, it's now strengthening. This gives you some context of what the chapter's about, but if you're just reading it, if, if your only answer is reading it, well I'm reading it because I have to. <laughs> Did anyone just have a, Notice a change in how you felt even when you thought about saying that to yourself? If, if you've got a chapter and you're just going, oh God, I have to read this bloody thing. Um, how are you, well are you set up for absorbing information from it? You won't take anything in from you won't, it. You won't take in much. You've already made the job difficult. So there's a huge thing that I could spend all night on. I'll probably keep coming back to it, but this is... So not only does this focus your reading and help you determine what you're going to get out of the specific reading, but it does reflect back to your mindset. Mindset, your psychology, your frame of mind, how you're actually feeling about it. Because if you just sit and go into it, it's like, okay, I've got to do this. <laughs> it's not going to be a terribly, well, the chances are that it won't be nearly as rewarding or, or useful for you as if you actually go, look, it's quite reasonable to, to, first of all, to go, okay, well, yeah, I've got to do it. That might be your first step. And you know sometimes when you, is it, have you had that magical experience of sometimes where you've gone, okay, exam's four weeks away, five weeks away. It's time I started studying. Oh, wow, that's so exciting. But you actually sit down and as you get to understand something a little bit more, it actually gets interesting. You have had that? Just checking. You have had that? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Please say you've had that once, at least once. So those kinds of things are useful to remember as well, by the way. So if you go, okay, well, look, I might not feel like it now, but there are times when you just have to do the discipline. So let's say, okay, well, I'm, I'm doing that. And then if you can then say, okay, well, I need some way to focus my mind so that I know that I'm going to get something out of it. And if you anticipate that you will get something out of, useful out of it, what's the first thing you notice in, literally in the way you feel? Interest. You might feel interest. Do you breathe differently or do you have, find your posture gets different when you actually genuinely get interested in something? Or is it all the same all the time? <laughs> Just checking. You become more attentive. Yeah, yeah, you'll become more attentive and so you set yourself something and try and make it useful in your terms. So this is a little bit of your own psychological management, um, which is a good point when it gets to exams. I mean, <laughs> they actually want to be in the best frame of mind. You also want to be in the best frame of mind that you can be when you're learning. Because, you know, there's, there's some great research uh, that reported, well, I can't remember what it was, probably four or five years ago now, they actually did some research, because we, we know stuff intuitively, but in good science we actually test things out. And people do learn better when they're in a good mood. Like you had to research that. But we, <laughs> <laughs> but we actually have the, So the, the, best, the better the frame of mind that you can put yourself in when you are wanting to learn something, the more effectively you'll do that. That's, 
not like being hysterically happy. It's, it's, it might be just drug or alcohol induced. You know, that's something <laughs> different. Uh, but if you're in a good frame of mind and you actually, particularly if you can allow yourself to anticipate that you, you one, you might learn something that you actually find interesting, but at the very least, something that you can go, okay, at the end of it, I can feel more competent and more uh, confident in my understanding of that by the time I've finished reading, then um, you'll be, it, that, that sets your whole system up. Your body will feel better and your brain will be asking a different type of question and absorbing the information in, in a different way. Okay. Um, questions at this point? So then depending on what you do next, or on how you answer this, that's going to change how you set about your reading. So if it's a general overview, you might actually just sit through and read, yes? Um, it, if you're wanting to um, use it to get a depth of knowledge to prepare for an exam, what would be some good things to be aware of in terms of your course? Talk out key words, key themes, key, key concept points. Um, do your courses have outlines? Yes. Yeah. Anthony, would it be fair to say that the course outline gives <laughs> an indication of the main things that might be said in assignments <laughs> or in exams? You would hope so. You would hope so, yes. <laughs> if we didn't as teachers, you might go, what on earth are we doing? So. Even have your course outline beside you and go, okay, well, do I know much about you know, market analysis? Do I know about market penetration? Do I know about SWOT analysis? Or what's the other one? Pestle analysis? Uh, what's some good ethics topics? <laughs> All sorts of things. All sorts of things, yes. Business. Yeah, yeah business. White collar fraud. fraud. <laughs> Corporate All governance. Yeah, governance, those kinds of things. Is it okay to take home the pens from work? <laughs> All of that kind of thing. So I might want to have all of those topics there and go, okay, well, what's my, you know, if, as we said at the beginning, if your teachers will show you past exams, that's good. If they won't, you just got to go, okay, well, they're probably just changing the questions just to tweak, <laughs> see what research you can do to find out from past people. But hey, um, then you would then start to look at the key topics and go, okay, well, hi, just grab a seat anyway, comfy. Thanks, it's my record. The, um, so find the you know, your key topics and go. Now, if, once you've looked at the key topics, what would be a good question for you to ask yourself? I keep asking you questions that are hard to answer, don't I? <laughs> but these these are good questions. So, um, if you can, and this will also reveal to you just how much work you might have to do. If you had to write the exam questions, or the assignment questions, what would you say? What would you ask? What would you ask other students to do if you had to write them? Does that give you a clue? And if you go, I've got no idea. <laughs> so that probably tells you there's a bit of work to do in depth of knowledge. But it also goes, okay, so, just trying to think about what some of the If you say, all right, I'm, I'm giving myself the imaginary task of either writing some essay questions for a subject that doesn't have uh, an exam, some assignment questions, or I'm writing exam questions. And if, if your first response is, um, I don't know, I've really got no idea what, what I'd write. What might be, and I don't know the answers to this, so let's see if we can workshop this. What might be some, then, a further set of good questions that would, you would ask yourself, or you could go and ask your teacher even, that, or and you could ask amongst your peers, that would, might help you actually clarify what might go into exam questions or essay questions. And Anthony, feel free to shout out other suggestions. Of, of Key topics. Yeah, so literally, what are the key topics? So these are the sets of... <laughs> no, 
you were going to know. Has anyone gone into an exam and didn't even know what the key topics for the semester were? <laughs> <laughs> so, which point you go, hmm, this is going to be an interesting discovery <laughs> exercise. <laughs> so you do want to know your key topics, but more importantly, what for each one of these, what do you want to know? What, what? At least an example. So yeah, yeah. What? Um, I'm going to put that down there. So example. The learning objectives. Yeah, what what are the uh, the theory? Yeah, what what are the key what's the key theory? What are the real principles involved? So what are the concepts? Yeah, what are the principles and, and concepts? concepts? And this is a really I had a, a teacher years ago that um, was, admittedly was in the neuro linguistic programming area, but you can do this with a lot of other disciplines. We actually had a uh, he's got a slightly newer version of it, but the one that we were taught at the time is in any piece that we're taught, what is, what is the content? Oops, content. What are the principles involved? And what are any techniques, or less for your case, say, applications? So that's a really interesting framework to give yourself because you go, okay, well look, I've got um, you could just learn examples and you could le just learn some techniques but you'll be much better at it and you'll be much better with unknown questions and questions you've never previously seen before if you're very clear about what the concept is and what are the principles involved in that concept. So the concept with something like a SWOT analysis, and by the way this, this, can be, this size can change, but let's take SWOT analysis as a concept. So base, what's the basic idea of a SWOT analysis? Okay, who's doing the marketing course? <laughs> it gives you an idea of where to go with your business. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? How you can improve on those weaknesses? Yeah, the, so the, internal and external. And I'm, I'm not a marketing expert, and even though I had 30 years self employed, I was still. Cool. Probably never did a proper SWOT analysis, but the concept is that you can actually you can examine your business or any business from a range of different perspectives, and one of the perspective one of the things is that businesses often um, sometimes just go, "Hey, we're really good at making up widgets and marketing those," and they forget about checking their weaknesses, and they might find that we've already the market is already flooded with wid widgets, so there's a threat out there. Um, they might go, oh yes, but generation whatever follows Z will just love widgets, particularly if we make them pink. So they might go, there's an opportunity. So that if they're only concentrating on their strengths and their opportunities, they might be missing weaknesses and threats. And therefore, what are the statistics like for new businesses, particularly self-employed people and small business? So like 90% fail in the first year? Uh, th yeah, I'm not sure, but certainly something like 80 to 90% have yeah. gone within five years, and I yeah. think most of them within the first year or two. So, and because a lot of us, you know, just start businesses and go, whoa, well, I've got this great idea, but yes, how well thought out is it? And every one of us has blind spots. So the, one of the concepts as I see it, oh, this may or may not be accurate, but in, you know, if I was teaching, go, well, look, we've got this concept called a SWOT analysis, which means there's a model for helping you examine your business and include perspectives that you hadn't even thought of or might actually not want to think about but you need to. And then the principles are that you can look at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and, and threats. And then, then there'd be some techniques for how do you actually do that? What are some of the questions you ask? There'd be templates for working with it. Um, and you, you might want to see it applied to small businesses and large businesses. Does that make sense? Yeah, so what are our concepts and principles? Uh, what are the objectives in using this, these, in any one of these top, topics? <coughs> and by the way, that if you can, if this is in the course outline, or you can extract it from your teacher, what are the specific learning objectives? Oops. Is 
because that'll give it a bit of focus as well. Have a useful thing, Anthony? Yeah. Um, it's, it's quite useful if somebody gives you an, an essay question to, to go back and go, where does it fit in the course outline and which, which of the learning objectives in the course outline is this meeting? And that might actually give you some information about how to approach it as well. Um, so key topics, objectives, examples. This was questions we needed to ask, wasn't it? Um, so that's information. What else might we need to ask ourselves? Is this one? Something like, how well do I know these now? And sometimes you need to be brutally honest, but also if you know it really well, or you know it reasonably well, it's fair to say that, um, which leads to, well, so what else do you need to know or need to brush up on to do a really good job in an essay, either as a, an assignment essay or as an exam essay, to increase your depth of knowledge? So the question for this one is what questions would we ask if we were going to write our own exam question or write our own essay questions. So we'd certainly want to know this, we'd certainly want to know how they match up with um, course learning objectives, we want to know how well you know that. So this might tell you you just need to keep revising this. But the next question from that would be something like what would you need to do to show actual understanding of these? I'll, need, I'll squeeze that one up here. We'll have those three questions, well, three things, which is probably the most important one. That, that last one. This one. Yeah. If, if you want to demonstrate that you actually have a, a solid understanding of a subject, then I'd need to know, well, what does demonstrate? It's not rote learning, just regurgitation, is it? So if you think about what could you write? Or, yeah, what, basically, what could you write or what could you do that demonstrates that you've got real knowledge of these concepts, principles and techniques to any one of these key to topics, then you'll have a much better chance of, one, being able to anticipate what might be exam questions and how best to prepare for them. Right. See you again. <laughs> I should swing the camera and <laughs> grab the... People. All right, is that helping so far? I'm doing a lot of talking. When I notice when I answer a question, this happened last time. I did a lot of talking and I'd ask questions and people would just nod. <laughs> Do you feel like a stand-up comedian with a crowd? Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, well, only the difference is I haven't actually tried very hard to be funny <laughs> because I usually am pretty tragic when I do that. It's uh, only the one line doesn't work for me. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Let me see. So these should be... For any of your essays and for any of your exam preparation, this should be questions that are, are, are consistently with you. I think that makes that's fair to say. All right, so now, let me check where you want to go from here. Do you want to do more on the preparation or do you want to do more on how you actually think when you're faced with an exam question? Could I, could or I, all of the above. Can I ask, so yeah. with the what to do to demonstrate understanding, um, if, if let's say the exam was SWOT analysis, yes. could you give us an example of what you have to do to demonstrate you understand SWOT analysis? 
Well, it depends on the question. <laughs> that's, that's my out. But I... Let me just see if I can make it up. And I'm not a, a, a marketing person. Or, or any, any other Yeah, yeah, but, but look, let, well, let's pick it though, because I've, and some of you are in marketing can tell me if, I'm miss, if I've got gaps in this. So it seems to me that an ideal question on that is that I would describe a scenario um, in a particular industry sector, and then I would describe a business, you know, probably a startup business, within that context, and I'd say, you know, Fred has just discovered that he's really good at doing, um, you know, animation, but he really likes uh, mathematics, so he's decided he's going to start up an e-learning business doing e-learning modules uh, with animated stuff to make mathematics really fun and exciting. And he's just bought him, he's going to go out and buy himself a Mac Pro and spec it up fully, that will cost him about ten or $12,000. And, and give you some a scenario about that and say, so based on the information you were given, what do you think uh, Fred's chances of success over the next five years? And I'd have to give you some, you know, be the true or fictitious market projections and things like that as well. So the, and, and then the question would be, you, use something like using a SWOT analysis or using a pestle analysis or using both, um, you know, explain to me what you think Fred's chances of success are over the next five years. Is that a bit hard for a first year? Might be, but that's, that's the sort of, so, but I want to give you, out of the information there, I want you to be able to show that you could actually fill out a, a template for a SWOT analysis, for example, at least come to some conclusion from that. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's probably nothing terribly new in that. But it was would be, you know, given the information, can I actually work out what this person's strengths at least appear to be, what their weaknesses appear to be, what their the opportunities are for them, and you'd you'd have the question would have to give you enough information to answer that as well, or you might put a gap in there and go, what information is missing? So I might give you a whole lot of information about his strengths and his weaknesses and his threats, and not give you much about the opportunities. And so one of the parts of the questions would be. Um, so what else would you need to be able to do, to, what else would you need to research to be able to complete a quality SWOT analysis? And you go, ooh, don't know anything about what the marketplace is doing and what his level of opportunity is. I think that kind of covers it, really. So in terms of demonstrate understanding, a lot of these things in marketing again, and uh, in ethics, is it, add in if I need to, um, they're going to come back to me. Can you take all these principles, all this lovely theory you've been learning in class, and I describe to you a business situation, and can you tell me what's at play in this? What concepts uh, would help you analyse the business, uh, assess the ethical performance of the business um, from whatever perspective, because there are a number of perspectives we could look at in terms of you know, governance or just straight fraud or... Um, philosophical, just, you know, the, you get have that whole discussion. I think that was in one of the first sessions we did, you know, something might be legal, but is it ethical? <laughs> so that's a huge question in some cases. So with, with any one of these things, what are, what are the principles at play and how well can you identify those principles in any given scenario, whether it's just a thing with numbers or whether it's a description of a um, particular industry sector and a business within that? Make sense? Does that answer the question? Good. So, let's think a, a little bit about following on from this. I think that might be useful. Would it be? Where do we go next with the reading? Let's suppose you actually really want to learn some stuff. <laughs> In detail. And memorise it. And, well, okay, that's a good question. So first of all, you've got to find out whether it's a memorisation game, or memory game, or whether it's an understanding game or combination. So there will be some things, often the principles and that, sometimes, um, and you'll have to work this out with your teachers. I mean, my students downstairs, a lot of them come from I've had one of them tell me, call me a fast learner, but after three semesters, 
the guy said to me, he said, but in my home country, the teacher tells us all this stuff, and we go into the exam, we have to tell it back to them. And I went, ah, that explains a lot of things. I said, yeah, we don't do that here. Like, if I give them a probability question, in, when I went to school, we had to memorise the formulas for things like all sorts of stuff. Um, but I'll give them the permutation formula, I'll give them the combination formula, because I, I actually want them to be able to use it, because you can always look those things up. So I actually want to know that they can pick the right formula and use it, because they actually understand and can think through the structure of the problem. So that then becomes an important issue with this one. So what's your objective? And I'm going to leave that there. It'll get a little bit messy, but I'm going to leave that there for a little while. Um, so if you're, if you're really just wanting to learn some detail and memorise things, because you might need to... What are some of the things that you might, for, uh, for ethics or marketing particularly, uh, might need to remember? I'll ask Andy, what are some things I'd have to remember? Yeah, for ethics? Yeah. Well, the, the issues in relation to the difference between legality versus ethics. You know, what is, where does ethics come from? Okay. Internal. So, are there strict definitions for those things, or is it more a, a, a framework for them? Generally a framework, yeah. Generally. So, if I was looking at it, so I'd want something like, um, well, I'll put this down as, as possible. So it'd be frameworks. Yeah. And I'll put it in, in these terms, framework, frameworks that, that define. Is that a reasonable thing to say for yeah. to help us distinguish whether it's an ethical issue or a legal issue? In some cases, it'll just be definitions. Like you said before, formulas as well. Yeah, there might be formulas. So there'll be some of that in marketing, I imagine. It might be just straight up um, models. Like the SWOT analysis and Bessel analysis. Um, I don't know how to put this one down, but it, it's that... Mi you might have to come up with a wording of something like concepts. So if I've got the, well I'll ask, if I've got the concept that legality may be different from being ethical, is that a, a reasonable one to put up yeah, in some circumstances? That we, that we use is like rules based accounting, you know, you, there's, there's rules associated with it, but, yes. but at the end of the day, compliance with the rules does not necessarily mean that the the outcome is ethical as such. Exactly. So I've got so I could start with a concept, for example, rules based accounting. You might want to know what one that there are rules. Do they need to know what some of the rules are? Not necessarily not for really ethics. Really. If you're doing accounting, mm. you in your accounting subjects you will. Um, but you'll also know that it's going to be useful to know some accounting terms in this, isn't it? Um, what's a good way of hiding a liability that you don't want to show? I don't know if it's a good way, but it's, it's done. I had one accountant that I got rid of that did it. Understate it. Sorry? Understate the liability, so it's mm. worth less than it actually is. Uh, you could understate it, or you know how you have your assets and your liabilities. Or classify something else. Yeah. And I've, let's say I owe two thousand dollars over here, and I'll go in as a credit in my accounting column, won't it? But what I could actually put it over here as as an asset. <laughs> it just has my minus sign in front of it. And if somebody's whip, whipping through, and particularly as accountants don't put minus signs, they they just do you know that kind of thing, which is weird to a mathematician like me. But they'll, they'll do that, and it's like, oh yeah, okay. And you just, if somebody's in a rush and there's no auditing going on, it's fairly easy to disguise a liability that you know as a neg you know negative asset. Um, I don't mean easy, but it, it is done. Maybe maybe harder to do now than it used to be. But uh, yes, I, I had one accountant who did that. And fortunately, we got rid of him after a while. So, 
so the concept is here, the principle is that there are guidelines that you could just follow those guidelines and you're doing everything legally and then um, you might have, for example, so a great thing to have here as, we've, as we follow on to make sense of it and start linking to your real world knowledge is examples. And depending on how, what type of thing you're learning, whether it's formulas or models or definitions, um, that'll depend, determine how detailed that is. Probably none of this is new, but hopefully just setting it out and these kinds of things. So we want to know um, the key principle here. So if you can actually work out, well, look, I've just got the concept, by the way, will usually just be a topic. And the principle in this case, for example, is that there are, there are strict rules, but the way you apply them can be done in different ways. Wherever you can, start noticing what, what you're learning, what you already know that facilitates, that links to that, because that'll help your brain absorb it. And then you add on the differences. So you, you do this first, and that's, that's not an action I put in that order. Once you've worked out what you know or knew a bit of, that then helps you make sense of these frameworks, your concepts, your principles, definitions, formulas, models. Um, then start paying attention to what's different. Do you have to repeat stuff to learn stuff well? It's not a trick question. The answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> the brain, how many types of memory have you got? Two. Yeah, and they are? Short term memory. Yeah, what was the first one, <laughs> Short term memory and long term memory. So one of the, there's, only, there's only one way to get something from short term memory unless you've got an extraordinary brain from short-term memory into long-term memory, and that is? Repetition. Repetition. So, that's the bad news. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. I don't have time for repetition. I'm going to have to make it. I'll teach. So a good thing, this was, I saw a, a chart on this years and years ago. I haven't checked up the latest research, but I think the bits I've heard along the way, it's, it's pretty similar. Uh, let's suppose you learn something today. So let's put days here. And I test you straight away. Uh, after it, let's suppose you, you know something like 90% of it. So you learn now, and I test you and straight away, like 90%. What's interesting is what happens if you just go away and do let's suppose you learn something and you actually do some repetition, you might repeat a definition to yourself, you might write it out, we'll look at some ways of writing it out in a minute. What, if I come back to you in about 10 or 15 minutes, what do you think might happen to your score? It often goes up shortly afterwards. And we actually know that when people um, stop focusing, you know those things where you, you it's a bit like where you're trying to remember the name of a town or the name of a person, you tip of my tongue and then you go away and think of something else and it just comes back. So we also know if people are working at, who's been working on a, an assignment problem where you've not known what to do, or there's been some problem in life and you've not known what to do, and you go, oh, blow, I can't, I've got no idea. Then you go and have a shower, and the shower's lovely, it's full of white noise. Immediately induces alpha state. And your brain goes, all the unconscious processes, and your brain goes. Ksh, 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 ksh. So if you put people in the things that measure brain activity, you can you can measure them while they're focusing on a problem, and then you can measure the brain activity when they're distracting themselves, just looking at the birdies in the trees or something. And there's a lot more activity going on. And one of the evidence of that is that you know those the times when you've had the problem and you totally give up on it, and ten minutes later you go, ah, oh, now I know what to do, or you wake up in the morning. So we also know that if you're studying something, it's good to take breaks every 20 to 30 minutes. You might just say you're going to have a three hour study session, but you work intensely on something, then stop and take a break for 10 minutes. And this allows your brain to get to work and actually help strengthen associations. But, so that's only about 10 minutes later, but one day later, if we don't do anything, I've forgotten the exact figures, but if it's about five to seven days later, you're down to about 20%. So 
So when's the best time, if you study a whole new um, concept in ethics or marketing today, when's a good time to do your next review, do you think? Five days. Sorry? Five days. Ooh, I wouldn't wait that long. What, to see how? Like, yeah, yeah. If you're, are you saying if you study beforehand and you want to know when you're... Yeah, so I've got this. Back to, I've got this chapter, and I really want to learn it because I know it's going to be tested in detail in the exam. Well, I have to know it really well to write a fabulous essay for Anthony. <laughs> so one day. So you want to test yourself a day later after knowing? Well, I wouldn't test this. I just do some review and then test yourself. Oh, yourself. okay, no. Yeah, so review. So I, I'd, I'd want to do a review here. And Sorry, then... I thought you meant a test. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> That's what I was saying. <laughs> five days later. <laughs> no, I want to Not do the a, next day. <laughs> I want to do a review here and then. Um, I forgot the exact recommendations. It's certainly no more than a week later for the next one. But it, probably if I'm really learning, even if you just have written out some really good notes and you just scan them very, really quickly, I would do it every day, at least for five days, so that you, you, you're keeping it up there. And then after that, at least once a week. So that's, so your review, Okay, yes, but I can't read the whole chapter every day. I don't have that much life to spare. Mm. So what do you do? Make good notes. Yeah. I'll leave that one up there. Is that new? Have, have you heard that before? Okay, that's important. Now, ideally, because we're doing a lot of stuff off the cuff. If this was going to be repeated again and again, I, I would have some nice, neat slides that I can hand out to you. But we are recording it. So if anyone wants to swear at me later, just let me know and I'll turn the video off. <laughs> or if I want to swear, I'll turn it off. <laughs> I do that. I do that. It's too much fun. Um, but you need to think of two, uh, we need to think about what works for our brain. So, your notes. What works better in terms of learning? Neat or messy? Neat. 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 Yeah. Lying in place of the obvious. Neat. <laughs> Who does neat notes now? Neat what study notes now. Hmm? What does that mean? Neat. Neat. Tidy. Clean writing. <laughs> writing that's easy to read. <laughs> so, by contrast, I could go. Which is easier to read? This one, yes? It doesn't mean you can't use running writing. Does anyone still use cursive writing? It could be. But that's a lot better than... Now why? It's really interesting to think why that's better than that or that's better than that. Because your brain has to work too hard to make, to make sense of it later. So this is one of the uh, problems with the so-called multitasking that so many people think they can do. <laughs> it's also the you know. People can't do it. Four, about 4% of people can do it, but that's about it, really. The trouble is everybody thinks they're in the 4%. It's not possible. Um, what about typing notes compared to writing them? Yeah, typing. Yeah, look, this is one of the ones where your individual differences um, will um, make it. What works better for when you come back to it later? But there is, uh, I've only seen one or two papers on this, but there's, there's growing evidence for the value of actually actively yeah. writing. Yeah. So, I mean, even, and I, my, my personal advice and current thinking on this would be, even if I make messy notes by hand first so that I know what I'm going to type up, later yeah, then that, that becomes part of my repetition process so you feel free to make messy notes but then do either a neat set or type them up or do them in a mind map or some sort of piece of software where you get nice notes but there's huge um, benefit from the physical engagement when you actually have to write I went to a workshop I think it's a good point to make um, and I think it was quite good what you said because if the test if when you're doing the exam, if it's a written exam, you should do your notes writing. If it's a
type of exam you should do, type, you know, just type because you'll, you'll remember it better. Yeah, yeah that, oh, okay, good. Let me, that reminds me of, I will put in a little bit about, um, yeah. I'll just write the word anchoring up, that's my NLP term, but it's, it's also a psychology term these days, so there we go. I'll come back to that because that's important. Um, in terms of setting yourself up psychologically for the exam. But yes, if you know that you're going to be able to type in the exam, then your final set of notes to work from would, would be smart to make them typed. Simply because um, if you actually know it when you're typing, when you get into the exam and you're typing, the brain's going, oh, I remember this. Yes, and it will help flow out. There are some other things you need to do as well. So first of all, neat. Um, investigate colour. Is it? You know those felt tip pens? Yeah. How many of you are using those for your notes at the moment? Yeah. One, two? Good. Get some felt tip pens and start using colour. I Is use colours on the Microsoft notes. Microsoft Word, you know those paint, you know? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah, get some, Save a lot of money get some for paper ones as well. <laughs> <laughs> so. Actually, it, it, I won't say it works for absolutely everybody, but it generally works for most people. I've, I've, I was years ago when I I'd, I'd started out school teaching and then I left that, but I did a lot of science and maths coaching for years. And then I read one of um, Tony Buzan's books on mind mapping, and I was also just starting to get interested in the neuro linguistic programming as well. But I also had natural study things. I was just one of the four people on the planet that loved school. <laughs> really, I loved it. I loved everything agriculture, French, Latin, English, social studies, maths, science. And embarrassingly, I did well at them all too. <laughs> it's just a weird learning machine. Um, but colour helped. Um, I had this... I should do a demo. So I had a, a student who came to me. She was one of my neighbour's daughters. She just got... you remember the, the thing from... Um, you know what it was like when you went from year 10 to year 11? It was like, kind of like a quantum leap. Yeah. And around about sort of April or May, you go, oh my God, what's happened? This is not year 10 anymore. This is exactly what happened to her. Her, her maths marks had you know, started off in the 70s and progressed down into the 40s, and she thought, mm, maybe I better get some coaching. And you know how some people have big handwriting and some people have little handwriting? So she had very nice, neat little handwriting. So if you looked at a page of her maths notes, it was all very neat. It was beautifully done, but it was in a pale blue biro. You know, it's dark blue biro, and it's pale blue biro. So it was in pale blue grow, it was all very small, it was all very neat, so the, the definitions and the formulas and the examples and the exercises were all very neat, very small, very pale blue. And I looked at it and went, so if you look at a page of that, what do you see? A squint. You just see a blue blur. Mm -hmm. So that's what the brain remembers. That's what it's trying to code in. There's nothing there. The brain needs stuff that stands out. So I said, okay, nothing else. I handed her a set of those felt tip pens because I was using them in, with a number of people at the time. I said, nothing else, you put your formula. So if I've got speed equals distance over time, you pick your favourite colour and it's not blue or black, it's anything else. <laughs> it counts. <laughs> <laughs> so you pick something vibrant like purple or pink or red or, and you put your, at least put the formulas in something that stands out because when your brain looks at it, you go, okay, good. You might want to put an example in something bigger writing, a worked example, because we also know that technical stuff, uh, people benefit from having worked examples and then, uh, then semi-worked examples and then examples that all exercise by themselves. So the next week, you know, she was back up in the 50s and the following week she was back up in the 60s and then she, the third week she said, thank you very much, I'm now fine. So I had to find a new client at that point. <laughs> All from a bit of colour. Now, it's not going to be that magical for everybody, but it will make a huge difference. Because you, you're, the question is, you want to ask yourself is, what can I give my brain that will make it easy for it to code in this message? So it might be written definitions, it might be... Um, and the other thing you can add into all of this mix, of course, is quality diagrams. Now, they might be graphs in some occasions, um, but for something like the framework where you're debating legal accounting practice with ethical accounting practice, is there an image you can come up with? Is there a cartoon that reminds you of a whole lot of the principles that you can associate with it, either your own or someone else's? So 
colour, neatness, make things stand out. Um, the other thing to investigate, again, in your own style, and you do want to make your own, um, they tend not to work if you use other people's or mind maps for summarising. I once suggested that in the training when I was doing some training at Optus and <laughs> one young man, he said, well, my parents are both university lecturers. They told me to do bullet points. He, just, he, he tried to mind map and he nearly freaked, nearly had a nervous breakdown. Or <laughs> but he made the stretch and he did his bullet points in colour. So like you were mentioning, <laughs> coloured bullet points was as far as he got. But it did actually help him learn the stuff. So you start looking for note-taking methods that'll engage you and make it attractive to you and provide stuff that stands out. And particularly if you can code things in visually because, you know, what's the cliche about a picture? Worth a thousand words? Yes, so you can often do that. Um, I was going to say with the... One of the things with slides um, when, we, when I'm teaching people presentation stuff, we know from cognitive psychology that we, we don't actually, you want the minimal amount of stuff on the slide as, as possible. So the whole point of a presenter, for example, is to present um, what, do you typically, what do you typically see in the corporate world? Slides full of paragraphs and someone stands off at the side and they, they leave you in the dark while they read it to you. And Two things are happening then, of course. Your brain's reading it. You're trying to read it yourself. For most people, subvocalize. So you've got two auditory tracks at the same time. And even if you're not subvocalizing, the evidence shows that that actually makes learning a lot worse. So if I'm reading something to you that you're actually reading, then the input just interferes. Um, so, oh, marketing people, when you get out to your organizations, in the training department, at least, at least let them take all the logos off the slides and things like that. I've had to have so many discussions over the years with, I have all these branded slides and you're supposed to go in and teach. Now, the trick with that, from a learning perspective, is even if you think, well, every slide's got the logo in exactly the same spot. So I'm giving you this slide, new slide comes up, exactly the same spot. So it should be, you can ignore it, can't you? Except your brain has to realise that it can ignore it. So it still takes up processing effort. You don't notice it, but your brain has to have a few milliseconds where it's going, oh, I can ignore that because it's the same as the last time. So every bit of information when you're trying to learn something that is extraneous to what you're learning will interfere with the learning. So that's why neat is important, having things stand out so that you can glance. So you know this review the next day, and the next day, and the next day? If you have a set of notes that you can just look over, literally in just 10 minutes, because it might have taken you half a day to summarise a chapter, but you should be able to go through and see all the key things in 10 minutes because you've made such good notes. So, so, so you mean, you, so you read the chapter the one time and take notes and then after that you just, you study your notes? Or you For the moment, well, you might come back to the chapter because there'll be some bits you'll miss and you might read it a couple of times before you actually make your, your final summary notes because you've got to know, you have to know what you're going to be summarising uh, and again, I'll come back to what's gone now, but the, the learning outcomes for the course, whatever your lecturers have been emphasising, what are the, what's the key way of approaching that chapter. But yes, you'll, you'll read it through, you skim through, read it through for understanding, then maybe, maybe even a third time to read through and go, okay, now I'm going to make my notes. But that's not necessarily the last time you look at the chapter. You might, because you know what happens when you learn something, what happens two weeks later? You realise you can add more to it. But it doesn't mean you spend hours and hours and hours redoing the same notes, but at least you have triggers that will highlight to you the key aspects from the chapter, and then it gets easier, or well, my memory of it is it gets easier to then, um, if you suddenly realise, oh, there's that bit in the chapter I hadn't noticed before, but that'll link up more easily because you've already got all the associations and you've been strengthening by doing this. So if there's something that you missed <coughs> pay, paying much attention to the first time, and it now it comes into your consciousness that that's needs to be remembered as well. It will be easier and you can just add it into your notes. Next point too, to, you know, those, some of the textbooks are set up with wide margins, so there's sort of marginal notes. So in your own notes, leave room to add things in when you get more depth as well. So 
just sitting and reading, you'd be a rare person for whom that works, by the way. Sit and read for entertainment, sit and read just for, if you've got, um, well, it's like, what was that, um, that report you had to do where you had to do the marketing one, where you had five journal articles or magazine articles. So that you, first of all, you just read them to get an idea of what, what, are the, what are they covering and how well do they cover the concepts. And then I probably have to reread them again to, to look for the details and start making comparisons with that kind of... What do you think about e-books and listening to those? Um, well, I use... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, don't, I haven't looked at a lot of research on audiobooks, but you, you could have those around. I'm not sure how well they go for learning detail, but certainly if you're listening to them you know, while you're doing the washing up or something, the question then becomes how much you're actually paying attention to them. So I'd be a little bit hesitant thinking that I could, I'd learn a lot from an audiobook. E-books, yes, I had to... When I was doing my PhD, a whole lot of books I wanted just weren't available here, so I had to get Amazon e-books to make it affordable. Um, but they're fine, but again, it's sad because I've got a lot of my books now are e-books, but the problem with an e-book, how much can you see? You've only, you've only got that little bit, and you don't even get the other side. There's a whole lot of peripheral contextual information in a printed book. But we're going to have to be working with e-books, but if you, you try and get the best readers, you know, Adobe Acrobat or read on big screen so you can at least see two pages, find an app that allows you to, to flick through quickly like you can with a book when you want to go from this to the references and then back again. So work with those kinds of things. I'm, I'm just thinking about audio books. I have problems with personal problems with audio books if I was trying to learn from it because what happens the book's talking away and what's very easy to have happen I start talking away to myself and you suddenly realize you haven't heard what the book's been saying for a while so that's probably going to work for a novel or something but I mean the thing to do is test it out and see but if I see anything in the next week or two on research on it I'll let Marianne know and she can let you guys know it reminds me by the way do you That might be close enough to two minutes, is it? Okay. Let's continue. Any quick questions? There are a couple of things about in terms of mentally preparing for exams. And I'll just emphasise this bit again about handwrite at some stage. Because of that, that and I want to follow up and see for some information in terms of how exercising your fine motor skills helps your cognition, but I think that was at least implicit in one of the articles that I read on this. Um, at the very least, if you're writing something, it's very much harder to fall asleep while you're doing it. <laughs> so, and, and particularly if you're asking your question, and if you go for doing your own diagrams or things like mind maps, or even if you're just thinking about you've got a whole paragraph, what one word or one phrase would summarise that paragraph most effectively for you? To do good notes, you have to be keep asking yourself questions like that. So, you know, what, what's the best summary phrase? What's the best summary keyword that'll help me remember the whole, the main idea from a whole paragraph? And that, that writing will actually help you stay engaged in that process as well. So that's strong recommendation. Um... Good. One thing about preparing for exams. Who loves exams? <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with it? Um, so first of all, in terms of your preparation, I've mentioned this term anchoring, and it's um, your brain does interesting things. Hi, and I just started. Your brain does interesting things in terms of associations or with state of mind and state of body. I don't know if I mentioned this. I've taught a few groups recently. So memory is state related. So this is something I was taught years ago in the NLP world, but I've since discovered that it's now um, in the cognitive psychology literature and it's well established that memory is related to state. Um, so who's been out, and some of you may or may not drink, <coughs> if you don't drink you probably know people who do, um, and who's been out and you know been on one of those had one of those world solve world problem solving conversations after a drink or six? 
<laughs> and you come up with this great idea, or you might have an idea for an assignment, or as I do with one of my colleagues in Melbourne, we have a great idea for training projects, um, when I was still trying to market training projects, and you'd be two or three beers in, and then the next day you go, we should have made notes. You done that? <laughs> I can't remember what that idea was, but I know it was really good at the time. Now, embarrassingly, this is, this is not an exhortation to become an alcoholic, by the way. What, <laughs> and this is in New Scientist, Stephen. When you, what, what, what makes it easier to remember the good idea? Drinking. Have a drink. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> preferably after midday. Um, so the next time you have a drink, often the idea will come back. So that, but a, a more, um, perhaps a more mundane version is, you know, the thing where you, you're getting ready for all day for work. <laughs> And you might be in the bathroom and think, you know, brushing your hair or your teeth, and think, oh yeah, I've got to take that book back to TAFE today. And you, get, you head off, and you get to where your briefcase is, or your bag is, or your backpack is, and you go, what was it? Now, what's the, what do we, look, what a lot of us do to remember what it was that we... Go back. We go back. Retreat your steps. Brush your hair or teeth. Oh, that's what it was, yes. <laughs> good, good. I thought oh, shit. getting old. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it happens, at, happens at any age. It probably happens more, more, more now because of all this stuff as well. Well, I found at home, it's just down the corridor. It's probably only, I've got a, an older unit and it's got a, a reasonably long corridor, but it's still probably no more than five metres. There is so much that can go through your brain when you walk five metres. So by the time you get there, you're in a totally different state of mind and body. So what's happening is when you get back into the bathroom, you go back into the same state of, state of physiological and cognitive being that you're in. And that's what the memory is associated to. So, and then by the time you get to your briefcase, you're already thinking, oh, I'm late for the bus or I've got to get the car or I hope I get a park today. And you're in a totally different state of mind. And now that memory is not nearly as accessible. Now, what a lot of people who are, are good at, they either learn to do this consciously or they unconsciously do it, they set up a memory trigger. So there's going to be something about my briefcase or my backpack. So while you're in the bathroom, what's something about your briefcase or your backpack or whatever it is, something that you have to do that's unavoidable that you can use to remind you to actually pick up the book. So. Having seen Harry Potter, if I have to remember to put a book in my briefcase, I put a big imaginary... Please don't tell my friends this. <laughs> All the rest of this. I put a big imaginary book. You know the howlers in Harry Potter? That's like a howler in my corridor. So there is no way that I can't, cannot see it and not hear it and not be attacked by it when I walk down my corridor. Because it's the only way I can get out of the unit block. I have to walk down the corridor. So. If there's this thing in blocking the path, then I remember the book. But I think of that while I'm in the bathroom. And then I remember the book. Now, you might not need to be that extreme, but if you're someone who's good at distracting yourself, yes. um, then exaggerated ones. First time I heard this, there was a train of um, interesting woman, Stephanie Burns, quite a good um, dynamic trainer, and she was talking about you know, having to remember the milk, and she used to have to drive along... Um, what is it, military road and under that pedestrian overpass. So how would she remember a milk? She planted a huge imaginary cow sort of hanging from it. <laughs> that as she drove under it, the commander would sort of slap against the car and <laughs> milk would slide down the side. So you remembered the milk. Not the milk. Well, so, the, yeah, this person in cl um, at work, they'll leave their car keys in the fridge to oh, remind yes. them to get the... The groceries? Yeah, yeah. My aunt used to do that when she used to visit too. <laughs> you can't leave without the car keys. So no, you've got it. They, and I grew up in the country, so if somebody came to visit and they lived out on a property, they'd bring their ice cream or frozen goods in. So it didn't melt while they came in for a cup of coffee, so they put their keys with that. On the flip side, if you put your car keys in the fridge and you forget that you've done it, how long is it going to take to find your car keys in the fridge and look near the <laughs> <laughs> They usually remember that one. <laughs> but, um, so, but really simple things. Um, your brain needs um, to be able to represent things to remember them. So even just simple stuff like, you know, if you've had somebody, if a friend or a partner, and you've said, you know, honey, on the way home, don't forget to buy the milk, what do they usually do? Yeah. 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 And your brain can't process, as far as I know from the bits of work I've done on this, um, the brain doesn't 
uh, process negative commands because it has to do two steps. If you say, don't forget to buy the milk, to know what the not is, it has to process forget to buy the milk. And you can quite unconsciously and very quickly, just in terms of how we have to interpret the language, make up this, you know, Homer Simpson um, scenario of getting home and going, oh, I've done it again, I've forgotten the milk. Yeah, because somebody told you to don't forget to buy the milk. So if you want to remember something, what do you think is a better instruction? Please remember. Please remember. And then you add in, remember to get the milk just before you walk, or get the milk as you pass, yeah, as you pass the, when you see the IGA sign or the coal sign or the Woolworth sign or the, whatever the other one is um, stop and you know find a park and go get the milk it's like a trigger so yeah so you set up a, a trigger there's something where you know I have to I'm coming home that road uh, or I'm you know I'm going to stop at Chatswood on the rail line there's Woolworths there I can go and get the milk so you set up something that's going to help you remind you so all of that by the way talking about memory being state related is really important for how you set yourself up for exams. Who, who gets excited about exams? <laughs> I gather that from the way you answered the earlier question. Um, who is relaxed about exams? Yeah. So when you're studying at home, studying? <laughs> I'll ignore <Studies>. that. <laughs> so when you're studying at home, preparing, getting your head together for an exam, thinking what questions are they likely to ask? If I was writing the exam, what questions would I ask? What, how, well, how would I show off my knowledge? And So let's suppose you've not been quite that self-aggrandising, but you're sitting there. Who has found at times you're working through something and you're reviewing it for, in preparation for an exam or even an essay, and you feel comfortable, kind of go, oh, I know this, or I know this reasonably well? Please at least one person say yes. Yeah, yeah. really. Yeah, 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 you have done that, haven't you? Yeah. That's the idea. At some point, if you're studying well <laughs> and using good techniques, there should be some point where, at least even if it's only one part of the subject, you go, OK, I know this bit. Now, when you're studying at home, and I'll assume you will be in the future, <laughs> starting tonight, um, when you're studying at home, do you, do you deliberately set out to make yourself uncomfortable or do you make yourself comfortable? You make yourself comfortable. So some of us all sit in a, on our bed with our pajamas on, or some of us all sit, you know, flopped around the round room floor or on the couch, and we'll have all this stuff around us, cold weather, a cup of cocoa or whatever it may be, and you're totally comfortable. And then what do we do to you at exam time? We bring you in and we stick you in one of these charming rooms. You're, these rooms up here are nicer than ours downstairs, by the way. <laughs> but even so, you know. You, this, these colours are quite nice, but they still have no name. I, I, when I went to school, all the all the exam rooms had that sort of that sort of grey, greeny, pale, mushroomy colour that just goes, and they'd be austere, and they'd, they'd be too hot or too cold. So, it, like you said, it's uncomfortable. So, there's a big difference between the state of mind and state of body while you're studying, if you're making yourself comfortable, and what happens for a lot of people when they get into the exam. So, in terms of being able to access information, one of the neat tricks you can do is make sure that once you think you know something well, is actually take time to rehearse remembering it in the exam room. So if I'm sitting around and I'm all comfy at home on the couch and I'm doing my study without wrecking my phone, I'm going, yeah, yeah, I know this, I know this. That's cool. It's going to look so weird on the video. <laughs> <laughs> I know this. That's cool. Stop and think, yeah, but will I be allowed to do this in the exam room? It would be a very generous invigilator who let you do it. So it's like, OK, while I know it, let's imagine that I'm sitting up in a room like this with just a single row, no one around me, and I've got my exam paper, and now imagine accessing it. And do you imagine it by getting a quick flick of an image in your mind, or is it something you say to yourself, or is there even some body sensation that helps you remember what you know that you know because you've just done it 30 seconds ago, and you're now sitting in the exam room, and you can imagine being sitting the way you would in the exam room, imagine the environment, and allow yourself to go through the imaginary exercise of remembering that information so that you can then use it to answer a question. 
So it's, a, it's, it's the same as saying, oh, you know, darling on the way home, please we, stop at the IGA and get the milk. You're setting up a memory trigger to make it easier to retrieve that information while you're in the exam room. It's really, I mean, I was lucky I never was too fussed about exams. I was quite good at them, so they were kind of just a you know, thing you did. But um, I found that most people are terrified by them. So anything we can do to set the, ourselves up to make the retrieval easy. One of the other things for a lot of people in our society, although it's because we've got a, a big mix of cultures here at TAFE, may not be as universal as it was when I was at school and uni, um, but a lot, very clear images that you've stored for yourself are often easy to retrieve. So um, I remember you know, when I was at school and exam, somebody would stop and look up and people would say, teachers would say things like, oh, the answer's not on the ceiling. Actually, for some people it is, because when they look up, they actually access a bit more easily visually. And they'll retrieve an image of something they've made a good diagram of, and it allows them to answer the question. So I'm not saying look at the other person, look up. <laughs> so if you've got things that you say to yourself, uh, certain tones of voice that you use, and go, okay, well, legal versus ethical, even if you say it in different ways so that you code in your understanding of those things. So it might be, okay, this is a question about legality versus ethics, so legal versus ethical. Oh, oh yes, I remember. Or there may be some diagram you've done for yourself. All those little tricks make a big difference. So one of the things you're wanting to do is, as when you're being all comfy at home and you think you know the thing, then allow yourself to rehearse being in the exam room and remembering that information. It'll see, it'll help a lot. So, how can I summarise that for you? So, you know, here, here I am, sort of... There's my book. What I want to do is get that nice, comfortable state of mind rehearsed in the exam room. Yes. Wait, wait, does that diagram help? Why? Why does that diagram help? One is a visual, and it's also, that was me on, <laughs> this is going to be your memory of it for years. <laughs> so I've actually sort of re redone what I, I was acting out here to actually, so that that gets linked to the, the actual story about how to set yourselves up for an exam. But also there's this transfer, I'll make that smile look more obvious. There we are. It's a bit freaky, but that'll do. Good, so memory state dependent. So make sure that you are, well, you're nice and comfortable or relaxed. You start setting yourself up to remember that kind of thing in the exam. And remarkably, you'll probably find you get a lot more comfortable doing exams and thinking about them as well. Okay, what do I need to help you with now? Would you, would you, so Peter, would you go as far as saying, I mean, this might be getting a bit too specific. But if if, um, if that's the case, and if it's the case, if you think of something in the bathroom, and then you forget about it, you go back to the bathroom to remember it. Yeah. Would you go as far as saying it'd be a good idea to try to arrange, if possible, to actually have study groups in the actual TAFE classrooms, like when the TAFE classrooms aren't being used? Yeah, that would, would help. That, that would be beneficial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would actually. Yeah, because if you if you're sitting around studying stuff together. And you do it in this, in this room, and you go, I, I'm so totally clear about this. Guess what? The room's going to help you remember that. Yeah. Good question. Next question. All right, I'll ask you. How many people use in color when they answer an exam paper? Do they? How many people? Um, in, in our class, I thought none. Probably none when they're actually answering the exam. So the, I was really suggesting that you're using the colour when you're making your study notes. Um, and it depends. I haven't seen any teachers, and I don't do it, do it myself. I don't expect people to, to use colour. It's not expected, is it? Yeah. No, it's not expected. And, is it and, allowed? I don't think it's allowed. 
They normally request blue or black anyway. Yeah, well, we normally because we want to mark in green or red. So, um, but there are ways around that. It would depend what I was teaching. blank side is scribble paper so they could I, I wouldn't mind at all if they used color on that for example but it's really it's going to be down to your teachers and things like that if it was something like um, I can imagine wanting to use color in a marketing exam your teacher probably doesn't but I can imagine the, there could be a case for that kind of thing if I was teaching art obviously <laughs> so you're faced with an exam question What are, the th what are some good things to do? Make sure you understand the question. <laughs> yes, Anthony. One issue is, is reading time and reading the question, I think. Yes. Um, Maybe you just plan the question play, before you yeah. start, start doing Well, yes. Uh, who, who's had essay style answers, or you know, even if it's not a full essay, just a, you know, a paragraph or two type thing, and you just start writing? Yeah. Is that a good idea? No. <laughs> it's a good idea to have some. Do most of your exams give you somewhere where you can scribble or make notes, or are you allowed to take in scribble paper? Because I deliberately set up scribble paper. There's generally enough paper. Yeah. There's enough paper there to be able to do something, yes. So let's think about the exam question then. Time in the exam to be able to read. Does that always happen, Anthony? Do you know? It should. Yeah. yeah. Um, ideally, it should. So, if the time's short, there's probably... Uh, hang that one there, we'll come back to that one. We'll try and think of a, a strategy for that exam time. Um, but not everyone does that. So, so I guess one of the things, if the reading time is short, one of, um, and again, depends on the answering format, it would be at least go through and go which questions are the most intelligible to you, which ones can you most easily answer so that you at least give yourself, oh, I can answer that one, oh, that one I've got to think about. Be careful of your language, by the way. So run this through your head. It's like, compare, oh, shit, I've got no chance with that one. <laughs> to, okay, I'm going to, have to, I'm going to need a bit extra time to get some marks with that one. Which one of those two is going to set you up better to be able to answer that more challenging question? Mm. The second one, isn't it? So even though you know, you, you know you're choosing your words, just the fact that you haven't said, oh, we've got no chance with that one, because it felt good as soon as I said that as an example. And we go, oh, that makes me feel cheerful. No. <laughs> Whereas if I say to you, or you say to yourself, okay, that one's going to take a bit more work, What's the, what difference do you notice in your system? Does your breathing different or do the, your muscle tension change or just your sen sense of being able to answer better? Well, there's some hope there, isn't there? Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, and you haven't cut off the avenues. You haven't set yourself up to, do no, you know, to fail with it. It's like, okay, you might be acknowledging, yes, I'm having... That one is one that maybe I'd like to know more than I do, but I'm going to look for whatever marks I can. Um, that's a good thing to remember too. Make sure you, you're actually going, I am going in here to get as many marks as I can. Do you know people who have gone in thinking, oh, I wonder how many marks I won't get? Or something like that. So one, again, setting yourself up for, okay, well even if, um, of course after tonight, you will do the appropriate amount of study, won't you? But in the past, <laughs> if you hadn't done the appropriate amount of study, it's still really important to go in and go, OK, well, whatever I know, I need to show that off. Because the more I can show off, the better. But OK, so your question. So first one was, along the lines of what you said, do I understand the question? But let's put it a little bit more specific. exactly is the question asking for? What's it really asking to do? And this is where 
all those things are your concepts and your principles and your techniques. You can be going, oh, it's, it's about this, it's about that. Uh, pay careful attention to the actual wording. Um, what, would, what would be something in Athens in the questions that you put in the essays that would, would make us, a, if you can think of an example where two questions might seem similar but you're actually asking for distinctly different things? Is that easy to come up with an example? Uh, area of strength, but it might be something along the lines of is it fair to say that both principle and based accounting and rule based accounting can be, both be abused? Sure. Yeah. So it could be something along the lines of discuss the proposition that principle based accounting and rules based accounting can both be easily abused. Pay particular attention to similarities in the system that enable this. Or, and I don't know if that's a fair question, or pay particular attention to differences in the system which make it easier for one than the other. Now there, then answering both of those questions while it engages some of the same stuff, it then gets a very different focus as you get into the detail. So just paying attention to, am I looking for similarities or differences, and notice one was, what are the similarities in both systems that enable this, or what are, what are the differences in the systems that make it easier in one than another, if that's the case. So that then gives you a very different um, focus on how you might do particularly the second half of your essay answer. Would that be a fair thing to say? Sure. Yeah. I don't want to come and do this subject now. <laughs> um, so, and that's why I put that bird there. So pay particular attention to the words and the, and the emphasis that's, um, that's given just from the way the question is asked. So what concepts and principles are relevant? I mean, a lot of this you'll do intuitively but it's useful to have just the point where you don't answer straight away. You read the question and you actually start to, you particularly this question. And then that's got to lead you to answering this next question. Relevant examples, if, if it's a question that can benefit from, or the answer can benefit from examples. And if you've got space, which I hope you will have in your exam papers, some sort of plan or scribble notes, anything that just that warms you up. Might might be um, so. If if you're used to mind maps, you might quickly do a mind map. But some sort of planning, thinking. Warming up <laughs> notes. Might be a mind map. Might be just, okay, I've got rules based, I've got rules, I've got principles. Um, this is the accounting styles. Um, and there might be similarities. And you might list a few differences. There might be examples of fraud. You might, if it's relevant, and just quickly, if you've got any form of planning space in your paper, quickly jot something down like that. And the, the two or three minutes it takes to do that, in most cases, will be well worth it rather than just diving in and starting to write with. Because what do you, even though it's sort of implicit here, the key question is. You've got to answer, and this will help you do it rather than just starting. You want to know a 
as much as possible. Sometimes things will emerge as you start to write. What, what do I actually want to say to answer this question? What, what's my point? What do I have to get across? And what, and as some of you found in writing your essays, if I've got this clearly, guys, oh, okay, right. Now, so if I, if I was answering this, um, do I start with similarities first or differences first? If it's relevant to discuss both of those things. Would it depend on your argument? It will depend on my argument, and it depends on the way the question's asked. So if I go back to the one where if I've said, um, what are some similarities between these two that allow that, I might ignore the differences, or I might have a, a short sure. paragraph about key differences are, but in this case, the, the overriding similarities yeah. that allow that, and then I'll have that as the second half of my essay. Whereas if it was the other way around, I'd say, while both uh, forms have these things in common, what's particularly significant in my view in allowing you know, Model X to be more open to fraud are the, these following differences, and then for these reasons. So it just changes the whole order. Uh, so it's been very clear, you know, because this can't be answered without answering that. Um, but then the, your flow and your, the way what you're going to emphasise and the, your point you're going to make that's going to impress your teachers is, you know, being able to use something like this to very quickly go, OK, well, it makes sense to talk about this first, then that, then that. But does that help? Yeah. Without actually giving you an exam question to work on in 10 minutes? <laughs> Why are you doing that? <laughs> you can look after your body during exams. Oh, having said that, what else am I going to write there apart from breathing? Drink water. Oh, yeah, hydrate. That wasn't it, but we'll put that. Look to the ceiling. Not so much that you have to run out for a pee all, all the time through the exam, but you know. Do, you do want to be hydrated. Wet brains work better. Um, posture. Think about it. What's one of the main things that your brain work uses? What, what fuels it? Blood. Mm -hmm. blood. Blood. Yeah, what does your blood take to it? Oxygen. Oxygen? Yes, and the oxygen is used a lot in metabolising glucose. When you're at rest, I think it's still something like 40 or 50 percent of your um, energy is being used by your brain. So when you're sitting in an exam, you're going to be using more. But to act, actually metabolise and work well, and, and think about your, you want to be organised to support your brain in thinking. So if I'm sitting over the desk like this and I'm trying to write my exam paper like this. What's happening to my state of it's already happening affecting you. <laughs> What's happening to my state of mind and my, my body and my cognitive functioning? Oh, am I helping it or not? No. No, there might be a rare person for whom this is suitable. But is it easier to breathe like this or like this? Now, if you're used to sitting in chairs like this or like this or like this. You might want to start practicing a few weeks before the exam to actually practice posture changes. Um, I mean, I sit like this because I do. I, up at my desk and at home, I sit on an exercise ball most of the time. Um, and I started doing that years ago because I do ballet and stuff like that as well. So I do lots of weird shit. Uh, <laughs> but, um, this supports the body really well. Best thing about an exercise ball is that you actually have to work. It helps maintain core strength, even while you're working. I love it. But you do have to be careful. I remember I was telling one of the, I was working this, the trainers came back one day, he enthusiastically had just come, come back from his OH&S uh, training, um, or work health and safety. And I was sitting on the, uh, that was one of the organisations that allowed me to take my exercise ball in to sit on. And he, he came, he came in, he looked at me on the exercise board and said, oh my God, that's so dangerous. <laughs> and I said, oh? He said, no, it's really bad for your back. I said, he said, I've got a friend who wrecked his back. He got one of those and it, he's, he's now got a damaged back. And I went, so, and I'm thinking, I've been doing this for a few years. So it's like, I said, let me guess. He heard that it was good, he got it, and then he tried sitting on it all day 
or all afternoon or whatever for, for the first time. He said, yes. I said, well, he's an idiot. <laughs> That's like going in, if I went into the gym and I tried to pick up 200 kilos and do a deadlift for 200 kilos. The, the little muscles that hold your spine, if they're not used to sitting up straight, it's a lot of work. And so they, you have to coax and train your body. So it's like, well, if, you, if you're not used to sitting up and having kind of posture like this, guess what you probably want to do? How long do you want to do it for the first time? Oh, about five minutes. <laughs> and then maybe, you know, go for a few times of five minutes, then see if you can get it to 10, then see if you can get it to 20. So build up to it. It's, it's because the, the, the little muscles that hold up the spine that run from vertebrae, vertebra, they're doing a lot of work. So, and if you overwork them too quickly, it's, it can be massively damaging. So that's, that's my disclaimer on that. But I am, it is very important, though, that to have a, a posture that facilitates your thinking and your being able to attend to what you're doing in the exam. And that's also something, remember, going back to going from this, where you're studying and feeling comfy, and you're starting to rehearse for the exam, start rehearsing the... Sorry, Andrew. That, no worries, we're just about done. Thank you my, very much. My pleasure. Um, so it's starting to rehearse a posture that's going to support you in being attentive and being sharp in the exam and being, having a chance to enjoy showing off what you know.